Hey guys, what's up? It is week 239. Are we on 239? Uh, I don't have an update. I have some stuff coming in the mail. Customs has been a bitch with one of my packages. Who knows what's going to happen? I don't. But uh, let's hop into the reviews. The first one up is from Cleopatra Films. And this is Lion Girl. And this is by Karando. Let's make sure I say this right. Mitsu... Uh, Mitsutaki or Mitsutaki. Uh, yeah, this director has done a handful of uh, kind of genre films. A bunch of them I've actually covered on the channel. But his first film that I saw was Gunwoman, uh, which came out in what, 2008, 9, 10, somewhere around there. And I remember really loving Gunwoman. He followed it up with Blind Samurai. And uh, he had some other films, Karate Kill, which is fun, and Maniac Driver, which is his most recent film. Yeah, but this one is Lion Girl. So, uh, yeah, Lion Girl is a bizarre film. It, it, it's definitely based on this um, kind of a manga uh, artist that he really loves, I believe, anime manga thing. And he drew this picture for him, and he basically based a whole movie off this. This is like a two-hour film. It honestly feels like there's a lot more uh, in the story. It, it should either be like four hours long or like an hour and a half. They either need to cut some or add some, if that makes any sense to anybody. Um this is kind of a strange uh, post-apocalyptic world. I see shades of Verhoeven in here, some of the satirical stuff with like the RoboCop side of news satire. That's definitely in here. I also see a lot of like Western influence and samurai influence. And of course, huge anime and manga kind of stuff influence in here as well. So the plot is kind of, it's, it's a lot of stuff going on here. It's post-apocalyptic kind of deal. Um, so in this world, there's been a meteor kind of attack. Uh, most of the population's dead. Um, there's been a meteor that attack that comes down. And if the meteors are exposed, the people are exposed to them, most of them die. But some of them turn into these Enochs. And there's also, they're kind of like mutated to monsters. And they go completely ballistic. And they're almost like demons. They have horns and everything like that. And then now there's like a mutation called the Enoch human. And the Enoch human basically, has these powers but they don't have really the bloodlust that the Enoch kind of mutants have. So this whole thing, this whole country, uh, this whole planet is run by this Toltarian government and basically the main samurai you see the Shogun you see is played by Derek Mears. He played Jason Voorhees in the remake. He pops up in uh, Hatchet 3. He's a really good actor. He's like a very physical big guy stuntman and starring in the main, main villain role here he's just He's perfect for it. He's great. He's just, uh, he's chewing the scenery, but he's just kind of like doing an excellent job because he probably uh, doesn't get to be that front and center all the time. He's more of, like I said, like the big stunt guy. Being the like main villain, he's excellent in it. And he gets a lot of dialogue. Very funny, very entertaining, very scary, intimidating. Just overall good performance. The best performance in the film. Um, some of the performances here and there, they're iffy, they're shaky, but some of that I think is due to budgetary constraints because at times the audio is not perfect. So if you're hearing a little muffled audio, you might be coming thinking that that, that might just be weak performance here. Um, but uh, it, it, like I said, not all the performances are as strong as Derek Mears, but there is some that stand out. So um, essentially there's this character in Lion Girl that's supposed to be the last hope for humanity and she's going to stand up to the Enoch monsters and the Toltarian government that has uh, uh, Derek Mears as a couple goons. Derek Mears is basically grabbing all the, the Enoch humans and, and mutating them and trying to suck their powers away. Um, that's similar to what was that one, like kind of like the scanner movies that are trying to find the scanners and take their powers and all that kind of stuff, or even the Mind's Eye where the main villain was basically taking these tele telekinetic powered people and trying to make himself one. All these kind of things is kind of what Derek Mears has going for him. It's definitely an X-Men kind of thing if you think about it, right? Like you have all those characters like Stryker and stuff doing the mutant experiments. So there's that going on. Uh, on top of that, like I said, there's a, essentially a very typical post-apocalyptic plot. These two, these uh, the main guy, a lion girl's like kind of sensei or father figure is hired to bring these two across country. One of them is an Enoch human. Is it Enoch? I hope it's Enoch. I've been saying it wrong the whole time. So take them across the desert and everything like that. The whole world's like kind of a desert at this point. But uh, of course they're going to run into things and Lion Girl's there as well. And there's going to be a big standoff, a showdown. There's flashbacks. There's kind of weird stylistic choices. Some of the lighting I really like. Some I think is iffy. Some of the effects are really cool. Um, there's a practical head explosion. Some of the stuff's practical. A lot of it's not. But in this kind of movie, you really can't have everything practical. It does come across a bit like you know the count, like the super like kind of Power Ranger style stuff, fight scenes, Giver even if you will. Not exactly. Um, some of the demons when they turn, they have these speeches, and one has this giant speech that's like you, you'd be better off 
dead. And this it's really actually effective scene and uh, just kind of really creepy for the movie and the character, the, the villain does a really good job in that. It's kind of hard to say if they're villains or not because they are possessed. But overall, I think it's uh, it's very ambitious. It's super ambitious movie. Uh, Carando's movies are always ambitious and I always have a, a, you know affinity for that, especially in a low budget film. You know, this is partially produced by Toei from what I could under- see in the beginning, which is excellent. Um, so, you know, it, it's so hard to watch an independent movie and just see them not have any, you know, any ambition. And like I was talking about this last week, I talked about Brian Paul's movies at dawn. They sleep ambition is there low budget and just ambitious and entertaining. And this one, it definitely tries to live out of its means, live, live past its means. And sometimes it fails and sometimes it succeeds. The lead character, um, lion girl, um, she, she's got a great look about her. Um, there's a lot of nudity in this movie, full frontal male nudity, and there's a lot of breasts and all this kind of stuff here. Lots of nudity doesn't shy away from showing the, the human form nude, um, which I can appreciate. You know what I mean? There's a lot of movies nowadays. Like I said, uh, my friend Dustin always joked around. It says movies nowadays in the theater, are just pretty people that are scared to screw in the movies and it, it does seem like that right it's just so nor- nice to see normal people or even attractive people just be nude or have this kind of thing in these movies it's different you know and now it shouldn't be but it's the way it is uh now a lot of people are saying it's kind of moved to tv the nudity and everything like that not that i need nudity like some pervert but come on it, it's just you're watching a lot of movies and stuff like that and you just notice it kind of disappear and you're just like wow that's strange um anyways lion girl i think i can recommend this like i said i was on the fence about a lot of it but overall i think that the ambition and uh, the story put into it and stuff and Derek mears win me over enough he's got a lot of good lines he's very funny and scary and just good overall really good in it um so yeah this is a little long i will admit it's it's close to like two uh, i can't think i remember the runtime i was just like oh over two hours just over two hours that's a lot that's a lot for an independent movie to invest it is kind of an epic if you would say um as far as the special features are concerned we have director's commentary conversation with uh, nagi the making of line girl the hollywood premiere screening with director cast uh, q a image slideshow and trailer so yeah if this sounds like it's up your alley check it out i would um if you like the kind of anime or it's not actually anime animated but but you know what I mean, like the anime style or manga style, I would check it out. I would say it's a more low budget version of Prisoners of the Ghost Land by, um, how did I forget the director of Prisoner of the Ghost Land? This is what sucks about getting old, right? Well, anyways, with Nicolas Cage, he's done Suicide Club, all that kind of stuff. A uh, good director. Um, and this one, I think is like a low budget version of that, kind of in a way, mixed with some Albert Pune from back in the day too, like some Nemesis maybe or something like that, that makes any sense. So yeah, Lion Girl, check it out. Okay, this next one here is from Ronin Flicks, and this was originally put out um, by Vinegar Syndrome uh, quite quite a bit ago, probably like five or six years ago, maybe even longer, and this is There's Nothing Out There from 1991. Now, I covered this for 1991, and I was a little harsher on it than I should have been. Now, rewatching this, I'm going to be honest, I like this a lot more this time. The director is Ralph Kankinski, I believe. Um, uh, how do you say his name? Kaninsky? Kaninsky. He did a bunch of movies. He did The Black Room, which I covered on here, which is kind of an entertaining movie. He did Nightmare man um but this one there's nothing out there it's kind of his biggest i think horror film now it's it definitely gets all the like credit because it's, listen here the cult classic that satirized the horror genre long before wes craven ever convinced you he did it first see and and that's uh cinema craze but like i have kind of a bone to pick with it this movie does have a randy style character which a lot of movies didn't have but if you want to do that you could go back to the horror kid right in in neon maniacs there's a horror kid in friday 13th part four there's a horror kid in creep show there's a horror kid these kids are self-aware of the horror genre or within the horror movie. Now, they don't go to this uh, far kind of reasoning, but if you look at stuff like House of Long Shadows, it's self-parodying itself, or Unmasked Part 25, or Psychos in Love, or Return of the Living Dead. These all have aspects of being self-aware and playing on previous things like this. Now, some of the characters, even originally dead, they understand that they're like basically within the, you know, the movie. They don't know they're in a movie like this, exactly, you know? And nor does Scream. Scream's not, they don't, characters don't think they're in a movie. They're comparing it to a movie. This one, like even some of the characters swing on a boom mic so it's a little different in, in that aspect and the the idea that it does share similarity to screen okay it does but the idea that it's completely the starter of it all is nonsense like i said scream did this did and it's it's always kind of been there in a lot of different ways and being self-parodying and everything like that it's just there you know what i mean um there's moments of all sorts of this self-awareness and pointing and like kind of breaking the fourth wall winking at the camera kind of deal and this the way it does it exactly is a little reminiscent of scream and maybe somebody did see it maybe kevin williamson did see it i wouldn't be surprised but like i said you got to give props on mass part 25 
Drive 2 for talking about this, the slasher genre and the killers and all that kind of stuff beforehand. But saying that, it's like I said, this first time I watched this, I was a little harsher on it than I should have been. Rewatching it, I enjoyed it much more. Um, I, I really actually liked the movie. So um, this is a new 2023 2K restoration of the film. So And that's the new stuff on here. There's a couple new audio commentaries as well, and I'll get into the second disc in a bit. But uh, this movie follows the story of a group of seven people going out to uh, a house by the pond. That's a great gag in here because there's a, a cabin by the lake as well, um, which is probably the best gag in the entire movie. Gets me laughing every time. So in the very beginning, a girl has this kind of nightmare when she's driving in a video store, which is great because you see all the covers of VHS's Midnight, all these kind of flashes of these crazy movies, Night Kill. Um, and, and you can tell this director is a horror fan. And seeing an older movie uh, have a video store scene is always a winner for me. So this character actually realizes they're having a nightmare. They end up waking up in the woods. They have a car accident and something attacks them. And, you know, with all the things on the cover here, the back and everything, you think this is going to be like a slasher or something like that, but it's honestly a little creature film, which I absolutely love. So these kids get to the cabin, and pretty soon there's a character in Mike who knows all the horror tropes. He saw the, the car crash, he sees the kids in the, in the lake swimming, and he automatically starts putting himself in a horror film. He starts to annoy everybody else as he's like a third wheel here, too. And he's trying to convince them that they're in a horror film. And nobody, of course, believes him until it's too late, and this little creature starts attacking them, it starts hypnotizing them, it starts eating them, it starts mating with the women or trying to. Um, this movie doesn't shy away from nudity. There is nudity, there is sex scenes. There's a lot of nudity, actually, and a lot of sex scenes. There's a lot of goofy fights in here. The fighting is kind of, it's not the best choreographed fighting, but it's not the worst either. It's, it's silly. Um, again, this movie has an ambitious idea, and it works pretty well at doing it. I like how it looks. I like the creature. I love little creature movies. And some of the humor really works for me. Other than, A lot of the other humor is like, eh, it is what it is. The acting is patchy in places, but it works for something like this if that makes any sense it's not horrible it's not like it's unwatchable but uh yeah i did enjoy the music too especially the song at the very end was very cute so this is a fun, goofy, weird movie. It's a new uh, scan. The old uh, Vinegar Syndrome looked good. I remember it looking good, but I don't know exactly the difference. This is a new scan here, new uh, 2K scan. So, um, As far as it does have the archival features on here, which looks like the stuff ported over from the old maybe DVD special edition and possibly the Vinegar Syndrome. But here's what's really cool about this freaking thing. There's a second disc in here. And this is Get Ready to Have Some Fun with over six hours of Rolf's favorite horror mo home movies, many of them never before released. We have a collection of his 10 shorts here. That features that he wrote, directed, and produced back in the early 80s. So I watched the first couple. I couldn't watch all of them. I watched the first couple, and then I watched part of his two feature films on here. There's two feature films on here. And then I watched his last short, um, Just Listen, before he made this one. So the shorts on here are The Hunt, which is really short. It's his first one. It's very silly. It uses Mr. Roboto in the music. I don't know if that's going to fall. Crazed, another short that's very very silly and short. They're like kids making these. Uh, Breaking and Entering, uh, Murdiously Funhouse. Undead, Strength in Numbers, Murder and Winner. Those are both feature length. And I watched some of Strength in Numbers, and it was actually kind of kind of cute. A lot of kids trying to do his mystery club, which is very funny. And then we have, that's 86, Murder and Winner. And then we have Peekaboo, Just Listen, which is kind of a, a horror movie about a character encountering kind of a crazy uh, attacker and then kind of losing their mind at the same time. And then, of course, Mood Boobs. Yeah, so, and he also does commentary and introductions on all this. So if you're like a completist on this guy's career, this is an absolute must. It, uh, it looks good, and it sounds good, and it's a lot of fun. And it's more fun than I gave credit for, and I, uh, that's why the second watch is always very important. And uh, a lot of older movies, I've seen dozens, you know, 20, 30 times. So you, you've already developed your opinion over time, and they usually hold up. But something that you watched once five years ago, and you pop it back in, you're like, you know what, maybe I was a little harsh on it. Or maybe I was a little too good with it, you know, whatever. But this is fun, good release from Ronin Flicks. Check it out. Okay, right now we have a double feature from Dark uh, Force Films here, and I'll be quick on these, but they, uh, this is Drive In, what, number 19? This is Smokey and the Judge and Alien Thunder. We're going to talk about Smokey and the Judge first. So this one opens up with a really great song, and it's kind of going over like a, a you know a tracking shot of all these pr women in prison kind of deal, and it, it's just playing this great song, and these two girls kind of bond, one's moved in, um, and they start to become friends, they start singing together, one gets released, and one shortly 
ultimately gets released afterwards. They have a horrible, uh, you know, um, parole officer. She's real. She's a jerk. She's not very nice. And uh, they start a musical band. They're playing in a bar that causes problems. And there's kind of a corrupt judge, a corrupt sheriff that they get involved with. There's a lot of running and speeding and stuff. Hell, it's Smokey and the Bandit, Smokey and the Judge, right? So the judge and the cop are after them. Um, there's some good uh, musical performances I like. There's some like weird kind of goofy guys in bars and just all around exploitation kind of stuff. It's not as mean spirited or as crazy as you'd think. Um, if I remember correctly, there's uh, some nudity and some sex and all that kind of stuff in here. It's very kind of light fare. Not the most memorable movie ever made. There's some decent car chases, some car crashes. It looks all right. No subtitles, unfortunately, but it's not the most amazingly original movie, but it does its job. It's Smokey and the Judge. Um, wouldn't hate on it, but I enjoyed it for what it was, you know, and I like the music in it too. Okay, the next one on here is a really bizarre film called Alien Thunder. And this stars, um, I can't think of the Native American in here. He's a, he's a bigger Native American actor. And of course, Donald Sutherland. And this is a Canadian movie. Donald Sutherland will be a Canadian actor. And he plays a Mountie in kind of the um, the old times and Native American uh, kind of times and everything like that. And they have like a, a this kind of reservation kind of deal where they have company cattle on here. And this young Native American guy kills it because the people are starving and feeds his family. This causes an offense. They track him down and arrest him. And uh, this guy basically escapes because Donald Sutherland is careless. He's drunk and lets his cuffs loose because they're kind of on decent terms and this guy ends up escaping and he ends up killing a fellow Mountie um, this causes Donald Sutherland to kind of go in a tailspin the Mountie was a good friend of his um, and he refuses to to not stop looking for him he kind of breaks all the rules he becomes very unhinged and a lot of this movie is Donald Sutherland kind of chasing this Native American through the old kind of the cold and weirdness and all sorts of stuff like that and of course it gets way out of hand and they have to call on the superiors and there's a, a pretty high body count towards the end of the movie um, there's good moments where Donald Sutherland sitting there talking to his friend's kid who who's gotten killed and he's just making him promises I do not know what Donald Sutherland is doing in this movie it is one of the off the wall performances like kind of like oddball or pinkly from dirty dozen he's just weird he's just like we're gonna find him he's so goofy and bizarre and just drunk and i do not know what the hell he's doing in this i do love donald sutherland but i don't know what the hell he is he's lost his mind in this movie for real but a lot of it is uh you know great exterior you know outside location shots beautiful you know woods and outside and all that kind of stuff wide angles just it, it, it's a good looking movie it's a little um slow it's a little tedious um but i think it's worth a watch i think it's worth checking out um uh, kevin mccarthy is also in here gotta love kevin mccarthy and when, when are you going to see Kevin McCarthy and Donald Sutherland interact in any other movie? Um, and it's great because everybody knows that Kevin McCarthy played the main character in Body Snatchers 56, and Donald Sutherland would go on to play the main character in Body Snatchers 78. So I absolutely love that idea, and they're in this movie together. It's kind of like the moment where um, Iffy Hollers, uh, Kevin McCarthy and uh, Royal Dano were in it together, and I was like, hey, Ghoulie's two old guy, Ghoulie's three old guy. I love it. But there's no features on here. You can watch them in the drive-in edition where they throw in trailers and kind of like hot dog commercials and stuff like that with the, the marching popcorn let's all go to the movies that kind of shit in here um some of the commercials are fun the trailers are cool as well but yeah this is not a bad release um this did have a dvd from scorpion Films, so yeah now if you want to upgrade to to blu-ray i would recommend it uh yeah so chief dan george is the guy i was trying to think of he's in a bunch of stuff anyways uh, i i love kevin mccarthy so it was great seeing him in here too but yeah this is a all right double feature i would recommend if you like these movies and if you don't I, you could spend a sunday doing something worse like going to church. I'm just I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, the next one here. So it was Halloween night, and I was thinking, I want to watch a classic that I haven't seen. I want to right a wrong. And there's a lot of classics I haven't seen. I will admit that. I've seen, like, the weirdest stuff. I used to hunt cult movies when I was a kid all the time. I was a weird kid. But I skipped a lot of the classics, and this one is, is probably my second biggest blind spot. I think this might be my biggest blind spot, especially knowing who I am and what I like. Here we go, 1951, if I'm not mistaken, I think so, and this is The Thing from Another World. Produced by Howard Hawks, obviously remade in 1982 by John Carpenter, and then a prequel in 2011. This is based off the 1938 uh, little novella or short story called Who Goes There, which is an excellent short story. Um, there is also remnants of At the Mountains of Madness uh, from 36, the H.P. Lovecraft story in here, um, in, in the remake, 82 as well. So I'd say it has a little bit of that. It has a, the, the remake from 82 is a little bit this movie and a lot who goes there, very much so. So the thing from another world. 
That's right, starring James Arness as The Thing, and The Thing looks very creepy. So, like I said, the history of that story, uh, who goes there, it's, it's an excellent story. Um, so this movie here, like I said, uh, they kind of get this weird signal that there's a radio signal, and uh, I think it's the North Pole here. It's not Antarctica like the other renditions of the story. Everything else is Antarctica. This one's, I think, North Pole, um, South Pole, whatever. It's not Antarctica. It's the opposite. So essentially they hear some radio disturbances, and there's like a group of 20, 20 or so guys going in on this mission and to figure out what's going on, and they realize that they found a ship. They try to blow it out in thermite uh, blast, and they destroy the ship completely. But there is somebody in the frozen block, a passenger, if you will. They decide to put him in the storeroom, and he unthaws quicker than they thought, and he's running amok around this kind of this base, and they really don't know what to do. This is different in the fact that it doesn't really take over your body. It does kill, and it has like these weird vegetable kind of DNA in there and stuff like that. They're really not sure what the hell it is. The, ki the monster is large and scary. This movie has one of the craziest fire stunts, if not the first full set of guy on fire stunt there ever was, I think, actually. It's really effective. It's a really great scene. John Carpenter always joked around about this movie being the movie of opening doors. There's just people opening doors and walking in. Hateful Eight would kind of parody this too uh, later on because uh, everybody's opening that door and it's freezing cold and it's just like this one is close the goddamn door. This that's in here a lot. Close the door. Close the door. Uh, what I noticed about this is the lead characters here. They're kind of like fast-witted um, dialogue. You know, like Humphrey Bogart almost. Like, yeah, what do you say, kid? And just being very like snappy with each other. And it's really good dialogue. There's a newspaper man there. The newspaper guy's great. His back and forth, kind of not trust the government's good stuff. Um, yeah, this is my, I'm going to say this, um, it's my, I, I do probably, I prefer it over the 2011 prequel, but of course I love the 82 version more than above it all, but I prefer the who goes there story over it. And then there's a radio kind of broadcast that's kind of more like the 82 version that's uh, from Chillers or Chillers or something radio, which is really excellent as well, which is shorter. So like, it's funny because if you watch who goes there, read the book, um, there's 38 are 35 characters, I think, somewhere around there. In the there, and then when you watch the 51 movie, there's about 18 to 20, and then you watch the thing, there's about 12, and then you listen to that radio show, which was the rendition of the thing. There's like six, so they always keep bringing them down, down, down. Um, none of the characters' names from the the Who Goes There are actually in the Thing from Another World. If you read the Thing from Another World and compare it to Who Goes There, you'll realize that the Thing 82 is way closer. And it's way closer than you think. But uh, I think that this one doesn't capture the story as much as the 82 version. Uh, I do like it. Like I said, it's a very classic kind of 50 sci-fi where they talk a lot about the science of the things. There's actually a female character. The only time they have a female character and a love interest in here as well. This one is clearly the most happy of endings because the thing is a dif different entity in it, right? The thing isn't the absorbing all like intelligent kind of creature. This one is strange and bizarre and big and lumbering, almost a Frankenstein type character, Frankenstein monster type character. Um, overall, I enjoyed it. I, I like it. You know, I'm going to like almost any 50 sci-fi when it comes to that as long as it has some sort of quality to it um but i just went down this rabbit hole of just like i, I went to the books i had the mouth of the madness i listened to that again i had heard that story before and i never actually read who goes there until i watched this and i was like well you know what it's about fucking time i do that because i love the thing 82 i like the prequel fine enough i want to see the original source material if i'm going to watch this movie as well and uh i, I did come out of loving the, the source material and still loving the 82 thing above all. I think it's the superior film in terms of acting, in terms of script, in terms of the idea of the thing. And like I'm saying here, this thing is not nearly as scary because it's straining blood, which is scary enough, I guess. In this movie, I don't think they could go where they wanted to go. Well, I think something like the Quatermass Experiment went there more. If that makes any sense, and that writer Nigel Nigel Hawthorne, what what's that? That's probably not right, but whatever that guy Penny Penny maybe I'm I, you know I'm getting all my writers mixed up. But Nigel, who wrote the Quater Mass Experiment, worked on some Carpenter scripts. And I think Prince of Darkness did he work on or Halloween three? All this kind of stuff, right? Halloween three, and you can tell he, he's got this weird idea of these big giant ideas and stuff like that. And and I think that the Quater Mass Experiment is definitely heavily influential too. The 1982 thing as well. Um, and, and the way they explain the monster is the red-eyed creature. He has like three red eyes in the ice in the book. And that's reminiscent of Horror Express, of course, from 73, which is kind of a riff on that who goes there story too, which is an excellent one. It's more of a take your body snatcher taking over kind of story here. Now, they could have went that way with it as well, but they didn't. So regardless, I think this is a good film. 
I, I think it's entertaining, obviously. Very groundbreaking, I guess you'd say. And 51 is pretty early RKO pitchers here. You know, when you think about it, uh, what was that? It came from outer spaces around the same time, Invaders from Mars. But you don't start getting that scary paranoia, although all sci-fi is super paranoia, Day the Earth stood still. But you don't start getting the real kind of like into that, and I say until Invasion of the Body Snatchers 56. But anyways, good movie. Another puzzle to the piece, you know, added another piece to the puzzle to complete it, my horror and sci-fi knowledge. Always got to go back and watch the classics and try to find the ones that you missed. That's why I do the yearly thing, and eventually I'll watch them all. Into that until I die, you know, I'm going to watch them all. I try to get as many as I can. So, uh, yeah, anyways, it was a great movie to watch on Halloween, and obviously I picked it because uh, it's a classic I hadn't seen, and also the fact is that this is the movie that they watch on the TV in 1970s Halloween, right? And uh, it was also nice to hear Carpenter on the McGarris show recently, McGarris's new show, uh, Postmortem Old Show, which is going off the air at the end of the year. So check it out where Carpenter says he never planned on remaking the thing. They brought it to him. And he's like, I love the movie, why remake it? And then he started thinking about it, and boom, we got 1982, one of the greatest horror films ever made, if not the greatest. I didn't say favorite, but uh, it might be the greatest horror film ever made. All right, guys, let's hop into those 1981 movies. Woe be unto him who opens one of the seven gateways to hell, because through that gateway, evil will invade the world.
as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago All right, the first one up is kind of a heavier hitter because I've been doing a lot of obscure crap from 81 because I'm waiting to get guests on. I do have another one recorded um, uh, for a guest, and I'm going to re- uh, edit that when I can. But this is the 4K release of 1981's Final Exam. That's right. This had a, a Blu-ray from Scream Factory, had a DVD from BCI, Code Red, I think, Scorpion, whatever. And I saw part of this movie whenever the first BCI DVD went, uh, came out. I popped it in. I don't know why I never finished it. And this movie always had uh, kind of a reputation of being a boring, um, non-eventful piece of uneventful piece of crap slasher. They're like, oh, it's nothing's worse than Final Exam. Fast forward to 2023. Boy. You made a mistake. There's a lot worse than Final Exam. There's uh, so many bad horror movies. Even in 81 by 81, there's way worse than fucking Final Exam. So I watched, I was watching this and I was like, I really like this. But I, I expected a slow, tamer slasher film. I remember the prank in the beginning of the movie. Back in the 80s when you can just tell how careless everyone was. Whoever wrote this script, I mean like... It was clear that, like, doing, like, felonies and crimes, nobody even got fucking punished. Like, in Revenge of the Nerds, just looking at people just raping people and putting cameras on. It's just like, no, nah, that's not even a, something to joke about in that now. <laughs> like, this one, so essentially, uh, it, it's a college film. In South Carolina, I think this one is. Um, there's a couple of characters that really stand out. Of course, Radish and Wild Man, and the coach is great. So um, there's an escaped convict. In the opening, we have a couple of people being murdered in the old kind of make-out hill kind of deal. It's a decent scene. And then we kind of fast for it and there's all these kids at college yada 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 and there's going hazing of course and there's a couple guys that lead this kind of this uh fraternity and they're they're douchey the one's wild man he's just this like football playing belching guy he's entertaining character and there's like this nerdy guy the guy that's obsessed with statistics of killers he's paranoid about all crime and everything his name's radish he's a very charming character him and the lead kind of female in here they get along great there's kind of like a romance kind of blossoming and i really like her too so like they establish all these characters to genuinely like them and it i will admit after that first kill there isn't a kill for like fifth uh, hour it takes that long guys it takes an hour for a kill that doesn't bother me I really don't care about that kind of stuff as long as I'm entertained. Um, in 4K, it looked great. Looking at the locations, I thought was excellent. Um, I like the music. It's very of the time, very synthy kind of horror score. Um, the characters I enjoyed watching, like I said, Radish is charming and entertaining. And, and just like an overall, like cute. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's just a little cute guy. He's funny. He's, you know what I mean? He's clever. Um, and then the lead is also cute. She's just like they have like an innocence quality about them that just makes you kind of want to li- like them. If that makes any sense, right? Um, so, like, what happens is you, you realize that this killer is just a crazy person. Um, and, and, like, they pull a prank in the very beginning, which would never happen ever, ever, ever now, unless you're gonna, you plan on doing, like, 50 years in prison. But it's an over-the-top crazy prank. And the sheriff's not that so mad about the prank. He's mad that he had to drive out there. This is the worst sheriff ever. Death Scream Sheriff and this guy, the worst sheriffs. They are so lazy. The only sheriffs that are worse than this are the ones that actually just start killing people. Like, or, or guys that aren't even really cops, they just impersonating cops, like like uh, Texas Chainsaw Remake, or, or, or like Midnight, or something like that, right? Where there's like, these are the worst cops ever. Like, this guy is so lazy, there's just a lot of hilarious scenes in here. I think the coach, he was actually somebody that, like, the Dukes of Hazard like, inspire, were inspired by, or something like that. This coach, in here he's great. The coach should have been the sheriff. At the very end of the movie, he comes running in with a bow and arrow, trying to, he's going deer hunting, he's doing it with a bow and arrow, so you know he's a badass. Like, yeah, man, I'm gonna earn my buck. So he runs in with a bow and arrow and tries to stop the killer, which is which is crazy. But uh, there's no special features on the disc, which is unfortunate. It looks good and sounds good. I really enjoyed this one. Maybe it's because I'm watching so many weird, obscure movies from 81 that I'm not having time to watch like the classics, like Final Exam. And I never finished this. It was one that I never actually finished. Enjoyable. If you like slashers, if you don't mind being a little patient, I think you'll enjoy this one. I'm trying to compare it to one maybe that... I think it's better than Deadly Games. I think it's better than Death Screams. Um, is it on the same page as Girls' Night Out? Maybe around that level of slasher. I, I like it better than Girls' Night Out, though, too. Um, but, hey, maybe it's the 4K in me talking or the 4K talking, but who knows? I enjoyed it. Final exam. Okay, this next one here is a Japanese one. A rare Japanese horror film from 81, and this is Daydream. 
This is kind of interesting because the director made uh, this film. It's based off. Um, is it based off uh, Joan uh, Sheen Joker, the guy who did like uh, his, his work was like Horrors of Malformed Men. I think this is he inspired this one as well. So he made this movie in 1964 called Daydream. Um, and then he goes ahead and remakes it in 1981. And then he makes a sequel to it, too. So there's Daydream 2. We'll probably do that whenever year that comes up. But this is a bizarre one. It is pretty long. It's honestly like an hour and 40 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. A little too long for what it is. But, hey, it's part fantasy, part crazy. It would make a good double feature if you just want to go softcore to hardcore. Watch Daydream and then watch Night Dreams um, from the same year. You're like, I want softcore, hardcore. Because this is, uh, you know, Japanese, so the, 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 the privates are blurred out. But they would be there if they weren't. Um, so essentially what we have here is this guy is in this dentist office and the, the dentist seems kind of like a prick. He's a, kind of a jerk. And there's this very pretty girl in there and they start to kind of put him under and put her under. And he starts to like, see like them kind of start to molest her. And then we kind of start this weird kind of fantasy kind of crazy world where he's obsessed with her, but she's under the control of the dentist and the dentist is beating her and raping her and making her do all sorts of weird things and doing the rope bondage and all these kind of things like that. Um, there's a lot of visual stuff in here. That's excellent. Her kind of wandering through the store. There's this crazy elaborate kind of like mall scene where I think she jumps into like this giant fountain that there's a restaurant in the middle and she's like banging on the window and everybody's ignoring her and she's completely naked and just been beaten and everything it's obviously going to be some allegory for a lot of things like that it's just it's a bizarre weird film there's a lot of great visuals and creepiness there's there's scenes of horror i would say because it's so creepy and bizarre and there is some blood and like kind of a murder and and it's just i don't know how to go about this movie but it's definitely a dream it's definitely surreal it's definitely nightmarish uh visually it's amazing there's a lot of sex scenes here too and sex scenes that go on for way too long literally i think there was one that was like 10 minutes and it was just like the same location so they try to get around you know showing the pubic stuff and they just don't want to pixelate everything so like at one point like where the pubic area region would be they take like a close-up of her face and put it on there so you're seeing two angles at the same time and it's all like kind of cut out because you're kind of getting this kind of rendition of hey might as well try to edit this to some sort of style thing instead of just like pixelating all the nudity and then just like showing this this stagnant shot for 10 minutes because that happens and it starts to play around with the editing and things honestly though i i, I love how J japanese movies look especially from you know if this look lasted a long time probably like the 60s all the way to the 90s or 2000s sometimes they have like a dark look but they're not like pitch it's not hard to see they just have a, a certain color aesthetic where it's darker looking and darker complected but anyways i really enjoyed watching this and uh i think it's a good movie i think it's interesting i would like to see um you know a company pick this up maybe uh synapse has this one i'm not 100 percent sure um i don't know if it's an akatsu or not but regardless i would like to see maybe some of the more softcore or bizarre horror oriented stuff from japan get a release instead of like you know uh some of a lot of the stuff that we you know from this time period i don't think a lot of films from japan are getting american releases we have seen some of the the cool yakuza films the modern day yakuza films and and stuff like that which are cool um the the Kinski, uh, Fuka, uh, whatever those like battles without honor and humanity and all the other kind of like sunny Chiba movies. I love seeing that samurai reincarnation is another one from Japan that I would consider a horror film, which is good stuff more so than this actually a horror film. But yeah, this is a an interesting movie called daydream. I would recommend checking it out. But if you ever were sitting in a dentist's office and started to daydream a weird, violent nightmare of sex and, uh, um, absurdity and insanity, then you'll like daydream. Okay, I'm going to be very quick with this one. Uh, this one I just popped on. I had like 40 minutes to spare. And it's an Australian, if I'm not mistaken. And this is a kid's film. This is The Monster's Christmas. Yes! And uh, this is a really bizarre film. We have this little girl in the opening. She's reading this Christmas book. And like this monster runs up to me. He's like, Arr, Arr. And he starts looking in the window. He ends up befriending her. He's like this big, like, I don't know, paper mache guy in a suit thing. Looks like a fucking banana split. And essentially what happens is the book she just read, they're going to kind of relive that book. And I'm not trying to badmouth this or make fun of it. It's just a kid's movie and it's fun and silly and cute. But it is what it is. So as she progresses, she finds this, I think, this wand or something that everybody else wants. So there's an evil person after this wand. And she's sending his little goblin goon that reminds me of, you know, one of the flying monkeys from Wizard of Oz after her to get this wand uh of course it's up to her like her big goofy monster to help her it looks like a, a christmas tree and of course this like this kind of like uh, mantis kind of character that did they have a penis hanging there i don't want to know if they did and a couple other weird kind of twin things to help them out um 
Don't ask me how it works. I don't know. It, it's a weird, bizarre fantasy. I guess it's horror. Not really, but it's listed as one, so I watched it. Monsters Christmas, a goofy little kids movie where they wander through fields and shake magic wands and do all sorts of absurdity. If you ever wanted to give your kids kinder trauma, I would recommend a Monsters Christmas along with, what was that, Visitors from Arcana, which has a bunch of nudity in it, so don't show them that, but maybe Peanut Butter Solution, um, which uh, Severn put out from Severn Kids. And there's all sorts of weird shit like that, you know, there's these kind of kinder trauma movies. But Monsters Christmas, yeah. Hey, it's up to you. You've, I've seen a lot worse, and I did laugh, and I didn't hate it, so it's enjoyable to what for what it is. Okay, next up is the Patreon pick, and this was from Jim Simon, and he picked um, Let Me Die a Woman, which is a documentary, more so an exploitation movie from Synapse. That's the DVD, and then, of course, it's in the Doris Wishman, the Twilight Years, with a bunch of stuff on there. So um, I'm dumb, and I forgot that I had this this Doris Wishman set, so I watched the DVD, and I was like, oh, crap. So I put in the Blu-ray, and I started watching it uh, with the commentary and just seeing how it looks, and it does have commentary by a transgendered person talking about it. And, you know, it did make me feel a little better about it because I'm watching this movie and I'm like, oh, this is clear bullshit. Like, this is early. This is like 1974. So Doris Wishman, guarantee she's not looking to insult anyone. And even for 1974, this is super progressive, okay? This stars a real doctor in it and he's clearly reading lines so poorly. He was like, and then the thing, like, and then a lot of people are ADR'd and read, oh, so it's a bizarre film. It kind of just follows a storyline of, or documentary about, a group of transgendered people, a bunch of random people. Um, and there's one main woman in here who's talking about her story as growing up, how she never registered as being a homosexual. You know, I always felt like a woman. I always, she almost seems like homophobic at the same time uh, in this weird kind of way. Um, you know, she just wanted to kind of be in that traditional, you know, relationship, but she wanted to be a woman. She was felt as a woman. So um, this movie goes as far as to say the doctor says that, you know, they're biologically born a different sex, but they physically, emotionally feel that they are another. And this is 1974 saying this stuff, so, you know, it's not really anything new. I know a lot of people that are upset with the transgendered people always assume that, oh, it's this new thing. In my day, we didn't have that. It's like, yeah, they just didn't talk about it. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, in my day, people didn't kill themselves. Like, yeah, they, they didn't talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of things are, that was always there. All the, A lot of this stuff was always there, you know, all these things that are different or weird or strange or, or um, bothersome to people even if there's nothing wrong with them people always act like they weren't there because <laughs> you know because back in their day it was better it's sunshiny the good old days right so like it's it's kind of an interesting piece to see this made in 1974 and see them talking about transgender people and showing transgender the problem is it is an exploitation movie so there's a lot of things that are incorrect there's a lot of things that are handled poorly and that's just the way it is, you know, like those uh, kind of like sun nudie beach things or Herschel Gordon Lewis documentary where it's like, this is a very serious educational documentary about how you don't catch herpes. And it would be like four hours of just a guy fucking a girl. And it's like, see, he's wearing a condom here. So that protects a little bit from the herpes, but he could still get it because like, you know what I mean? Any reason to show sex or nudity or anything sexual or just this weird kind of thing in the, in the culture, they're definitely going to show it in, in certain ways. And the commentary does point out things like, well, that's not right doing that and this and that and stuff like that. Overall, it was an interesting watch. It's when you come to rate something like this, you're like, I don't fucking know how to rate that. You know, I guess it was interesting to a certain point um it was exploited at a certain point i'm par far past i know people are like i don't really get offended by movies i, I they're from a they're from a time they're from a place um even if they weren't i would just be like that's pretty bad that's fucked up and i would move on i don't want to give some things attention if it, it doesn't really bother me i'm saying and these movies are dated in time it's okay if you people can't watch them it's okay to let people know what's in them maybe it's not for them not everything is for everyone right so that's what I'm saying. Like you warn people what's in it and if they think they can handle it, they can handle it. You know, I don't really have a problem with any film. And in fact, the way I look at film, I look at it as somewhat educational entertainment and educational, um, you know, uh, and, and lots of things and historical all, all on the same point. So I don't censor myself typically when I watch things, uh, I just go in, I don't. It, I don't look at it as an offensive thing most of the time. I don't have those glasses on when I'm watching something. I will mention it if I think that it could bother somebody or if at the time it's clearly dated, but I'm not going to say things like, it's problematic because, you know, it, it's it's an old film. You should expect these things, right? Um, regardless, uh, I mean, there is things that don't date that are just like, wow, that was way ahead of its time. It comes across really nice. That's always funny. Like, you're like, oh, wow. You'll read like a, a Playboy article. It's like, Lee Marvin's nice to gay people. And then he's like, and then that woman, I told her to get back in the kitchen. You're like, oh, shit. 
<laughs> it's always like that, right? Like somebody will be like, "Hey, I'm doing this nice." It's like Roger Corman is like, "I gave all those women jobs." It's like, "But you want you just did, they're really good at their job. And you just didn't want to pay you didn't pay them less or something like that." But Corman knew that they'd make the best movie. He didn't give a fuck about who was doing it. It was for money, you know what I mean? Like, but he also was progressive in a lot of ways. But as a, you know, it's progressive in a weird way, right? Exploitation can be very progressive in the weirdest ways, and. Let Me Die Woman probably has a lot of that in there, too. So, uh, yeah, I guess we're going to hop into the questions. All right, questions, comments, concerns, and all that jazz. Oh, I wanted to ask you guys a question because somebody brings this up, and I think this would make a really fun kind of question of the week. We're starting that out right now. I want you to please explain a movie you remember but don't know the name of. So, like, somebody asked me about that, like, earlier. So, like, there was a movie back in the day, Enemy on Scene. And I didn't remember the name. And I'd be like, and what happens in it is like, there's a scene where a guy, they're in like a mission and it's uh, like swamp Australia. And this guy shoots at this alligator and this guy yells at him. And then later he gets killed by alligators. And I remembered finally it was enemy on scene. And uh, yeah, so like the scene I remember was a girl like getting sacrificed to the alligators or crocodiles. Um, so like, what's a movie that you remember uh, scenes in? I want you to explain it and try to guess the time. Like, is it seventies? As much information as you can say about it. And tell me, and then we're going to try to guess this movie together. Or you can tell me a movie that you couldn't remember the name of, and you finally found it out, and it made you so happy. We can do either of those. So, yeah. And let's get into this. So, MJ, uh, consistently giving good recommendations for my watch list I never heard of. Hope you had a happy Halloween. I did. Thank you. Um, Bold810. Mr. Parker, I have known uh, you for about 22 minutes, and I must admit that this... That it is Halloween 23, but you look exactly like I would expect Mr. Slave from South Park to look like in real life. Thank you. That's when I had the mustache. I don't know. I was like, thanks, I guess, you know. Uh, Kentucky, Kentucky Nader, 23. Yep, I feel that Brad Wesley when I try to watch independent stuff. Will you turn that shit off? I can't watch that. It's got no heart. There's so much stuff that got no heart. I made a joke one time. I was watching this movie. I was like, the actor's got no passion in his eyes. Um, Hudson, 3838. Uh, good stuff, Mr. Parker. I would buy Rabbit Grannies just for the slipcover alone. Question. And it's Halloween. Uh, will you be having goulash for supper? It's the best I got. Have an eerie, mysterious, ghostly, uncanny, weird, unearthly, sinister one. No, I didn't eat goulash. I don't remember what I ate on Halloween, actually. I probably, I don't remember if I ordered out or what. Wasted time to control shop. Dave, when were you... When you were young, have you ever uh, seen five minutes of a movie and didn't know what it was and you're still on the hunt for the movie? Thanks for the video. Uh, there's a couple. There's one. Um, I'm going to have you guys guess mine. There's a scene. Um, I think it's got to be one of the Tiger Claws movies, possibly, where, like, this guy gets... This person gets completely brainwashed. I think it's a female. And, like... The bad guys, the good guys going in after the bad guys, and like there's this guy not wearing a shirt, and he just like has his like his nails, and he's just like ah, goes all over his, this dude's chest and like kills him, like scratches his chest as shit. And then there's another one that was like a Kumite style blood sport ripoff, and there's like this big dude fighting this little slithery snake guy, and the big guy holds the snake guy like this, and the snake guy starts sliding out, and he just, just breaks his back. Those two I can't remember. That's it. The rest I found out. I recently just found out one um, with uh, Jim Varney in it, where it has like a, somebody who can set fires with their minds. I can't think. I, I, I found the name. I, I got the movie written down, but that was one I saw as a kid and I could not remember the fucking name. And I finally came across it and was like, that's one. Um, there's another one too, Enemy on Scene, which I mentioned was one that I completely forgot about. Believe it or not, at age like four or five, I watched Monster Squad 5,067 times and forgot about it from like age six to nine. I could not remember the name. When I found it out again, I was so happy. Uh, there's a year or two where I couldn't remember Monster Squad because I was so little. But yeah, so, and then here's where we go. Uh, Travis Linscom, 6200. I just watched Arnold 2. It was so much fun. I loved it. I felt like it was made for me, although it's a terrible name for such a cool film. I didn't have a chance to check out the Sam Deacon video essay yet, but I'm looking forward to hearing that. Happy Halloween, Dave. Back at you. Uh, Movie Junkie Reviews 84. There's just something I love about Roger Corman Cheapies. Recently watched both of those again. Yeah, they're great. Nick Mua from Belgium. Yes, yes, Rabid Grannies, Belgium's very own best of the worst. I should revisit that one ASAP. All the new features seem mind-boggling. That's love of cult film for sure. Questions. Which 2024 home media release are you looking forward to the most? The 88 Films, Pete Walker box set looks mighty sweet to me. Um, you know, it's probably a set that I didn't even know was going to get announced. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of stuff that I didn't know. I'm sure Severn will have a giant set. I, I think they're hinting at Cemetery Man. I don't know if that's coming out this year or next, but I'm very excited for a Cemetery man special edition do you think you could outsmart or overpower the killer from final exam i don't know bro catches an arrow right out of the thing i could probably outsmart him 
but if I don't know he's coming, I'm dead. Um, and you know what's funny is about Final Exam is I noticed some similarities between this and Scream 2. You know, tying to the tree and stuff like that. And who doesn't? Kevin Williamson definitely saw Final Exam. Um, but I don't know if I could outsmart him or not. Um, probably not overpower him, guys. He's a crazy killer. You can't overpower those guys. Um, so then we have three. Many seem to agree that The Guardian was William Freakin's worst movie. I really enjoyed it. Plus, gnarly old trees have always creeped me out. Man, I think Jade's worse than The Guardian. Um, I, I don't mind The Guardian. Loved your latest Troy Howarth episode. I hope the pair of you will do a commentary together or a video essay in the near future. Um, happy, happy Halloween to you and the cats. Um, we're, he's definitely coming back for House by the Cemetery and the Beyond. So, he's going to be on there for those. Explosive Action. Film Masters was founded by the same guy that started Film Detective, which he was since, um, which he has since sold. So, very similar taste. I thought so. Cool. Um, and Stephen Hyde gives the flex and a heart. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, let's just get in the Patreon drawing here. I'm going to draw five names out of the bag. No update this time. Like I said, I'm waiting for stuff. Got a bunch coming, but hey, who knows when it's going to get here. Let's do five. Ooh, I got, how many I got here? I got two. We got uh, John Wilhelm, any Mondo Macabre release you haven't you haven't seen but you want to? Check out. I love that. That's number two. Ooh, Jim Simon, Killing. The Killing, Kubrick. That's always a great one. What else do we got here? Two more. Jim Carroll, Where the Crawdads Sing. Dan the Cameraman. Jamie Gillis movie I've not seen. Okay. I'm not going to show you that. You guys have to take my word for it. And last one is going to be coming out of this bag and it is big trouble 2002 jim simon jim simon is just like on top he's got everything there's like eight jim simon in there but uh anyways there's a lot in here though i really should start digging in again if you haven't been drawn out in the last like four or five times just let me know and i'll bump you ahead but uh yeah we're getting out of here all right guys thank you very much for watching and as always have a good one Meh.